good afternoon gentlemen and friend ladies it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all for this distinguished lecture series uh, on energy efficiency which we are holding on uh, monday first monday of every month for last three months uh, as you know cii green business center has been involved in several activities to disseminate information uh, to, and uh, to bring in some distinguished uh, speakers and experts to speak to all of us the objective one is to make uh, complex concepts understandable to all of us as well as bring in newer ideas for us for us to take up today we have the privilege of uh, shri nk ranganath uh, ambassador and uh, former managing director of grand force from india to address us as a distinguished as part of the distinguished lecture series on energy efficiency Mr. Ranganath and uh, Grand Force has been almost synonymous with pumps in India. Um, Mr. Ranganath has been an, an excellent engineer, a power plant expert, a project expert, expert in boilers and heat recovery. Been the founder of uh, Grand Force in India since 1998, 1998, and uh, has contributed extraordinarily to pump energy efficiency improvement in in, in India. Apart from being an excellent engineer. Uh, Mr. Ranganath has been an excellent communicator. Anything and everything on energy efficiency, Mr. Ranganath uh, uh, has got very clear views and ideas and also contributes a lot in communicating and reaching out these concepts to the larger uh, community in India. He's very passionate about energy efficiency. He's also very passionate about India-centric innovation uh, and uh, he's always ready to give a helping hand whenever we go and seek him for uh, any time to speak to us, assist us, guide us on energy efficiency in industry or buildings or pumps. Mr. Ranganath has contributed tremendously to the uh, energy efficiency movement, green building movement, and also to the water efficiency activities of CII for quite some time. Apart from being the managing director of uh, Grand Force and contributing to pump energy efficiency in, in India, Mr. Ranganath is also on the boards of uh, several other companies, including uh, the, an NGO called Banyan. So we have an uh, excellent engineer and an extraordinary communicator. Without much further ado, I leave the stage to Mr. N.K. Ranganath to take over. Mr. Ranganath, sir. Thank you, Giri. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me first thank uh, Giri and CI GDC for inviting me to this third lecture on energy efficiency. Uh, we've had Ravi and Umi preceding me, and uh, they gave you a nice perspective on the subject, both at the macro level and at the user level too. So I will also try and give an overview, trying not to repeat what they said. I'll also delve into the specific area of pumping system in which sector I have been working for decades. All of you know we are living through tough times. We are already facing, we were already facing a world. Pardon me? Yeah, we were already facing low growth in the economy and we were being negatively impacted by the effects of climate change when we were hit by the COVID-19 virus, which almost has brought the world to a standstill. It will perhaps take a couple of years for us to claw back to the economic position we were before COVID-19 hit us. For all the negative impact it has had on the economy, COVID seems to have had a positive impact on the environment. We had not breathed such clean air in our cities, nor had we seen such clean waters in our rivers. We even had animals and birds from the wild visiting the city, perhaps to see the humans locked up in their homes in a neat reversal of roads. We were the zoo animals. This is perhaps an opportunity for us to learn and change our behavior. We need to learn to live with less and be mind, more mindful of uh, sustainable practices. Energy efficiency, as all of you know, impacts the climate. It has a direct impact on CO2 emissions. Uh, better efficiency improves the economy and saves money for all. When I see what's going to happen in the next two or three years in the corporate world, there may not be many ground, brown or greenfield uh, projects that are going to come up. Uh, and most businesses will focus on bringing down their fixed and variable costs per unit of output to help them remain competitive. Energy is a major contributor to the input cost of any product or service. And the more efficient we are, the more we will save. 
let's look at india's position now india is a rapidly growing economy which needs energy to meet its meet its growth objectives and we need to do this in a sustainable manner when we look at energy security we need to have a very holistic approach to what we need to do um, a holistic approach in the sense that we just don't look at electrical power but we also look at fuel for transportation for process heating cooling fuel for households for cooking heating etc uh, all the energy that we require to to run our daily lives is something that we need to look at all the time i'm just trying to put my phone on silent okay uh, having said that we look at sources of fuel and energy that must be accounted for we start with coal oil and gas hydro nuclear wind and solar geothermal biomass waste heat and finally energy efficiency which is also called a source of energy i don't know um, most of you must have heard of the word megawatt negative watts the more we save the better it is and uh, mind you if you keep the life cycle costs in our minds it is less expensive to save a unit of power than to generate it especially if we consider the embodied energy to extract the fuel the intrinsic energy that is there in the fuel versus the electrical or mechanical energy it generates uh, we will see that it is far more uh, cheaper to save one watt of energy than to produce one watt of energy as you know conversion from one form to another always leads to losses so increasing energy requirements in india coupled with a slower than expected increase in domestic fuel production means india has to import a lot of its energy requirements and with the nation growing very rapidly demand for energy will increase as of today if not among the top 3 india is at least among the top 5 greenhouse gas emitters globally and this is something that we need to keep in mind but having said that out of the 1.3 billion people that we have around 30% do not have access to electricity in their homes they may have electricity in their village but not in their homes and about 40% still use firewood for cooking of course this is coming down due to the government's ridiculous scheme and perhaps will continue to go down but yet there are a considerable number of people who are using firewood which is perhaps one of the most inefficient ways of uh, using fuel if you look at 1920 india's net imports uh, were nearly 227 million tons of crude oil and its products and about 200 million tons of coal which to me is perhaps close to 50% of the total primary energy consumption of the country we are still dependent on almost 50% on imports though india's proven coal reserves happens to be the fifth largest in the world government is doing something about the privatizing coal and trying to increase the production of here if you look at oil consumption india is ranked third after usa and china let's look at renewables we have we have a focus on we still produce only about 10% of our electricity in india through renewables and still 75% is coming through thermal and the rest of course is through large hydro and a small 3.5% through nuclear the focus in the past has been on supply side and with the poor efficiencies and low plant load factors coupled with the huge transmission and distribution losses there's always been a deficit especially during peak load times of course this has changed in the recent past uh but uh, perhaps from a 12% deficit we are now down to a little less than 1% deficit which itself is a great job done over the last few years the focus on demand side management began perhaps uh, over the last 5 to 7 years after the establishment of uh, be in 2002 and the introduction of the energy ratings and the and the pact scheme uh, according to a power ministry report uh, the, the initiatives taken by the be on energy efficiency has led to a savings worth around 89122 crores in just 2018-19 which is considerable and these efforts have also contributed in reducing about 152 million tons of co2 we have uh, pledged in paris that by 2030 40% of our installed capacity will come from renewables efforts have been made but though these efforts have been made to harness renewable energy it has slowed down a bit over the last year or so and we need to refocus on establishing sustainable models the slowdown has been 
um, a kind of competition where prices were driven down to unsustainable levels. We need to find a way of ensuring that it makes business sense. As I already said, the deficit is now less than 1%. In, in 2019-20, it was 0.5%. In terms of million units and uh, around 0.7 percent within PTOs. To be really energy efficient, we need to harness all forms of energy, especially that which is wasted, and improve overall system efficiencies. We cannot. We have to look at it holistically. We, need, we cannot look at it in a siloed fashion. And this needs a system approach. The approach should be both on the demand side and supply side. Energy efficiency norms have to be specified for all energy consuming equipment, much as we are doing in the automobile sector. Motors, which are perhaps universally the highest consumers of power, need to have standards that are high, that are global. Uh, our minimum standard in India, I think, is now IE2. I'm not sure if it's been made a standard, but uh, a minimum standard has to be IE3, and uh, this should be made uh, universal across all equipment used in India. China has done that recently. Energy efficiency norms should be for pumps, fans, air conditioners, refrigerators, and all white goods that we use. And I'm glad that uh, CII GBC has come up with some green products, and I do hope they will extend this to all those products that we use in our day-to-day -day life. Parallelly, we also need to improve the generation efficiencies of our power stations and reduce the TND losses or what they call at &C losses, which today are at an average upwards of 25%. This needs a shift from tendering based on the lowest first cost to one based on the lowest life cycle cost. Life cycle costs will account for efficiency, repair and maintenance, and disposal costs too. You actually think from cradle to grave and rebirth. This is very important if you need to change the way we are looking at things in terms of uh, conservation and efficiency and its impact on the climate. In other areas too, there are many examples of energy recovery. In our day-to-day -day areas, in cars that we use today, we have regenerative braking. We have an engine cut off while waiting for signals. <clears throat> in processes using steam, we, start, we had cogeneration for many years, condensate recovery for many years, waste heat recovery. And now we have been able to even uh, uh, start recovering low-grade heat. We also have micro turbines that can be used instead of pressure reducing valves to recover the energy lost when we bring down pressure of steam. Because once you bring down cut pressure, that means you're, you're sort of put in energy and you're killing energy without any useful work done. Today, like I said, we are able to recover low grade uh, heat from furnaces, heaters, air conditioners too. Similarly, condensate whether hot from steam or cold from air conditions, air conditioners can be recovered and the heat extracted in the water we use. Actually, in our uh, office and factory, all the condensate from air conditioners, the water is collected and reused, and uh, it's not let out. Air conditioning systems that are perhaps the highest energy consuming equipment, and uh, these in any building perhaps account for a major portion of the energy consumption. But these are becoming more and more efficient uh, with the advent of variable secondary uh, systems, variable primary systems, variable peak chillers and now variable speed tertiary pumps replacing valves at the AHU combined with uh, IOT. Uh, and uh, these have given rise to optimizers, which then control the entire system, a, very, a total system approach, bring down energy, energy consumption to as much as even 0.4 to 0.45 IKW per ton of air condition, which is phenomenal. The advent of green buildings and habitats, as well as the green products which CI, GBC, and the IGBC has promoted in India, has had a significant impact on the energy and water consumption in India. Coming from the pump industry, let me give a brief idea of what can be done to reduce energy consumption when using pumps, which almost consume 10% of the world's energy generated today. But one should understand when we talk about technology. It is not a replacement for a poor mindset when it comes to conservation. It is only an enabler for us to help they take the right decisions. So the solutions that I talk about are enablers and not solutions for a poor mindset. Let me see if I can sort of uh, put these few slides that I have. Uh, I might need some help, Venkat. Let me see if I can not find here. Yeah, I think I can get there. Uh, are you able to see?
Are you able to see this, Venkat? Hello? I just need a confirmation. Uh, your uh, yes, sir. presentation is visible, that. but it is in presentation mode, sir. If you could please make on, it to hide the presenter's mode. Yeah. Oh, it's, a, it's in presentation mode, is it? One second. Let me see what I need to do. Yes, sir. We are able to see the second screen as well. Yeah. So you're okay? Will this or I have to change the way it looks? Uh, no, sir. You have to right click and change the hide presenter's view, sir. Right click. Nothing. Uh, okay. Hide presenter's view. Okay. Are you okay now? Um, just a second, sir. Ah, now it's fine, sir. Now it's, now it's fine, sir. Fine. Perfect. So I was telling you that pumps actually consume about 10% of the world's electricity even today. And these are very vital. Pumps are very vital to one's life. These are just like the heart that we have in our bodies, which is the world's best known pump and made by God, pumps are required for every conceivable uh, uh, need if you need to live or if you need to run our businesses, whether it's floods, droughts, etc. you need pumps. Today, as we see, 663 million people are without clean water and about 2.4 billion people are without sanitation. Now, pumps provide and remove water and this is essential. So if you look at what we need to do now, uh, I already told you 10% of the global electricity is consumed by pumps. And most of these pumps, even if not required, run at full speed. One must understand if, if you run at full speed, whether you are consuming water or not, you are consuming power. And that is very, very inefficient way of running a pump. So one needs to see how we can sort of ensure that we run pumps efficiently. But before we go into any kind of technology, we did a, a kind of a audits on pumps, almost 22,000 pumps since 2006, and collected all the data. And we found that the saving, savings potential, if you see the graph, for process water pumps is about 29%, for air conditioning 31, for cooling tower pumps about 35, and water treatment pumps about 35, and boiler feed pumps about 36%. This is what we have found uh, universally. It, uh, on an average of 35% of the power that we are consuming today can be saved very easily, which gave, gave this little uh, note that I put on the side. We felt that energy is expensive, efficiency is not. The potential for saving is pretty high. There are many reasons for inefficiencies, and I'll come first to a mindset. First of all, improper selection. You know, technology is not a solution, like I said before. Improper selection is something that one needs to look at. Lack of pumping system knowledge, or simply a copy paste kind of situation where I did this before, I need to do this now. That doesn't work. The other thing that we have is procurement based on price. Let's cut corners on this, corners on that. Let's reduce the price. Doesn't matter if the efficiency is a little low. Let's buy pumps that are cheap to run, to buy, not to run, because nobody sees the running costs. The other thing that we have seen is design. You know, when you start adding losses or, or what you call safety factors to the losses that we estimate, everybody in every step starts adding losses. If we see that little cart there, that cart is loaded with all the things that we have actually loaded in terms of the actual losses. And finally, that horse or the donkey cannot sort of really pull this. You need an elephant. So where you require perhaps a horse or a donkey, you put an elephant of a pump because you have not sized it properly. The other thing is unnecessary planning for the future. So you plan for the future, that is good. But any building or any factory does not go into full production on day one. So people buy pumps which are sized for full production, just one pump or two pumps, one working, one standby. And then you start running them before it, it, the factory or the building gets occupied, which may take a year or two or three, you will be running pumps so inefficiently that you will lose a lot of money. Better way of doing is to have multiple pumps which come in, switch in and switch out, or perhaps leave a place for adding pumps in the future 
so that we can add them as an event to the cloud. The other one that is also a uh, 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 kind of uh, situation in India is this uh, next word, chalta hai to chalne do. You see that pump there on, 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 the, on the right. Uh, it's an old pump, it's, I don't know, 25 years old, 30 years old, but nobody wants to change it because it has not failed. We don't measure or monitor what is the requirement now. So we have inefficient pumps and some of them run at 25% efficiency. The classic case is, was, was, in a, was in a very large steel mill when we went and replaced a 25 kilowatt pump with a two kilowatt pump and it worked very well. So when one needs to look at your basic engineering practices before you get into technology. The other reasons for inefficiency, sizing of pipes. You know, very often when you look at design, the piping design is done by somebody, the pumps are chosen by somebody, somebody else gives you other data. And generally, bigger pipes are more expensive, so you start cutting down the size of pipes. But the moment you undersize pipes, you create excessive friction loss. And for the rest of the life of that building or that factory or that process, you'll be consuming more electricity. And normally through the life cycle, you see that you have paid four or five times more uh, for the pump that you have bought cheap or for the size of the pipe that you have bought cheap. Design for optimum suction discharge velocities. Higher velocities means higher losses. Make sure that you have the right velocities. Then valves, where you can avoid a valve, please avoid a valve, or if you have to have a valve, please ensure that the valves are sized right and there are no high pressure drops. Avoid unnecessary reduces and bends. Simple, these are simple common sense engineering practice, which is common no longer. We have got into an era of looking at a screen and asking software to tell us what to do. We have lost that little bit of that sense, which says, ah, this is good engineering practice. This is what it should be, because everything comes out of basic physics, chemistry, and biology. And if we tend to forget that, sometimes we lose the good things thinking that uh, uh, all the answers will be given on the screen. It is not unfortunate. Undersizing electrical cables, great savings by undersizing electrical cables. But again, like I said, like pipes, for the rest of your life, because of increased resistance, your power consumption is going to be much, much higher. So if you look at a life cycle of a pump, 10% it's is, is its initial investment, 5% is the maintenance cost through its life, you take a life of 15 years, and 85% is the power cost. So when you look at your next pump or when you're choosing it, please choose wisely and look at all the areas and don't look at pump only as in its own, look at your entire system, your piping, your equipment, your valves, the way you've taken your piping around, what kind of pressure drops, look at the entire system. Closing. Earlier, how do you, okay, you can be very efficient, you can choose the most efficient pumps. How do you maintain energy efficiency over the life cycle? Basically, it requires innovation, design, and efficient equipment to ensure that we have reduced energy consumption through the life cycle of the pump. Now, if you look at pumps, earlier we had pumps which are at a fixed speed. Then we started getting pumps with variable speeds with a drive added on. Now you have pumps with the drive on the motor itself with all the sensors built in. The next step that you see in the box there you have a complete IoT system with sensors all over and what we call adaptive technology where the pump learns how you use it and what it needs to do to ensure that it is running at its most efficient point throughout its process, throughout its life cycle. And if there are any issues, it will even give you a signal as to what is going wrong. So it's very vital to have a system approach to deliver higher efficiency and use IoT, use your startup systems use uh, all that you have today in terms of electronics and sensors to make sure that you have a system which is tuned to run at the highest efficiency and save you the largest quantum of power. All of you are, are smart people, you're good engineers. All you, that need, all you need to do is to work out what is your payback period. And generally, mind you, generally we have seen at least 40% of the systems paying back in less than a year 60% of the systems paying back less than two years, and almost 80% of the systems paying back less than three years. It's only those few with very super sophisticated kind of things which have a payback, you know, say maybe four to five years. So it's very important that you look at this when you look at these systems. 
So by optimizing total systems and not individual products, you have you ensure that you are having efficiency right through the life cycle of your system. Okay. The new thing that has come to the world is IE5 motors. They were introduced about three years ago in uh, Europe. And a couple of years back, uh, we introduced them in India. Uh, although they are expensive, they are the world's most efficient motors. They have embedded electronics, they have embedded drives. It offers over 10% energy savings and perhaps 25% reduction in playback time compared to even IT motors. I've given you two examples in these. One is a 5.5 kilo motor, a kilowatt motor on the left, and the other one is 11 kilowatt motor. So if you see an IE1, which is perhaps the standard in India, if it's at 84.7% uh, efficiency at full load, mind you, these are full load efficiencies, and the efficiencies drop considerably at part loads where most of the pumps or blowers work. But compare that to an IE5 motor, which is 92.6, and an IE3, which is at 89.2 for a 5.5 kilowatt motor. And an 11 kilowatt motor, you see similar, very similar, there's almost uh, a 7% difference between IE1 and almost a 5% difference between IE, uh, IE3 and uh, 3 to 5% difference between IE3 and IE5 motor. So if at all you have uh, processes that are running 24 by 7, I would advise you look at the motors, not necessarily on pumps, on blowers, on conveyors, on whatever you have. And if there's a variable load and it runs 24 by 7, you probably will save a lot of energy by looking at IE5 motors. Uh, the next one is air conditioning. I spoke about air conditioning all. Uh, intelligent solutions and cooling systems, uh, there was variable primary before, then they came with the variable secondary and primary came together. Then we had uh, uh, two-way valves replacing three-way valves in the AHUs. But today you have these small pumps that you see in the picture replacing the valves in the AHUs so which eliminates the need for balancing valves and air conditioning, offers self-balancing the hydraulic uh, circuit, and also reduces the power consumption because then you can size your, your primary circuit or secondary circuit a little lower and allow these pumps to run at variable speed to actually give you the right kind of cooling. And this can be one per issue or one in a couple of issues, which then help you save a lot of power. We have seen, uh, and we're using these pumps easily a 30 35 percent uh, reduction in the power consumption in most areas in air conditioning systems so this is the end of my slides questions uh, the mindset the mindset is this technology is something that we need to sort out in our own minds we need to take questions like i said technology is not a replacement for a poor mindset or poor engineering when it comes to conservation it is only an enabler to help us to take the right decisions and ensure sustainable conservation. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Thanks for your address. Uh, I think your address covered right from a sector.